My name is Bruce Hamry, and I'll be moderating this session. We appreciate all of you taking time at the end of a busy day and time away from your families to participate in this. We're going to have a very short presentation before we get to the main purpose of this meeting, which is to learn from you, your experiences uh, and uh, issues with assisting your patients and their families in getting uh, timely and appropriate health care in Vermont and a number of other issues we'll go through. I would note we are recording this session. The purpose of that is to allow us to accurately capture all of your comments, uh, advice, and the issues you raise in addition to the notes we're making. We are also being joined by some um, members of the staff of the Green Mountain Care Board and the Agency of Human Services. We may have some legislators on the, uh, on the call as well. And if so, I would ask them to please identify themselves and make whatever comments you wish to make. Mark McDonald, uh, Senator from Orange County, here to listen. Thank you, Senator. Others, please. Okay, well, a couple of quick housekeeping points then. Uh, as always, please stay on mute when you're not speaking. But when you wish to speak, if you can find it, and uh, sometimes I can't, uh, under uh, reactions is a, an option to raise your hand. Uh, if that's a problem, put your uh, video on and wave. We'll call on you. We'll stop periodically to ask if there are individuals on the telephone who would like to comment. So uh, we'll get started. Gretchen, can I have the next slide, please? This is what we're about. The legislature passed Act 167 last year. Uh, it has several different sections. We are working on one, uh, and that section requires the Green Mountain Care Board in collaboration with the Agency of Human Services to conduct a data-informed, patient-focused, community-inclusive engagement process aimed at helping Vermont's hospitals reduce inefficiency lower costs, I would say constrained cost growth, improve population health outcomes, reduce health inequities, and increase access to essential services and maintain uh, adequate capacity for emergencies. Green Mountain Care Board has asked Oliver Wyman, my group, to lead this effort uh, to ascertain uh, your uh, interactions and those of the community, as well as a number of disadvantaged uh, and other groups suffering from health inequity, uh, to determine inter your interactions with, pardon me, the health system and needs, pardon me, perceived needs to improve equitable health care access as well as outcomes. So what we're about is we've spent uh, several months collecting available data, as well as reviewing state uh, reports and prior efforts in the areas of health workforce, mental health needs, housing needs, uh, information technology at a state level, and so forth. We've spoken with a number of state legislators. We've spoken with many of the state agency program directors have a few to go. We've spoken with all but one uh, group of hospital leadership and are now speaking with a number of the board, uh, hospital boards. Uh, in the last uh, five weeks, we've conducted over 100 meetings, all virtually, and in the next couple of weeks, uh, we'll conduct roughly another 25. Many of these uh, will be focused on smaller groups of individuals of, and groups affected by health inequity by virtue of gender identity, language, ethnicity, 
uh, rural uh, travel issues and other related issues. So those are in progress. Um, the, uh, so we are now conducting the listening sessions among those groups, community meetings, these provider meetings and community meetings are both being held at a, a hospital service area level. Uh, we've also conducted four general statewide community meetings. The provider meetings we define uh, as anyone who gives care in the community. So that includes not only physicians and nurses and advanced practice people, but also emergency medicine technicians, dentists, dental hygienists, physical therapists, psychologists, social workers, nursing home people, home health agency people, and others. So we're trying to reach as broadly as we can. At the end of these, uh, these sessions, which will be before Thanksgiving, we will collect your uh, observations and, uh, and the issues you raise, take those into account with the information that's available, and formulate a series of options for the hospitals and the Green Mountain Board and ultimately the legislature to consider. We will then subject those to intensive analysis to determine the potential impacts of those on both the hospital and the community it serves and receive the results of those analyses, which will be done by a different group uh, late in the winter. So we'll reconvene, take a look at those, reformulate the options as needed, <clears throat> and then come up in person to uh, speak with the hospital board and leadership at the hospital. And then following that to have a general community meeting in this part of Massachusetts, a town meeting uh, of the citizens of that area uh, to again discuss what those recommendations could be. And from both those groups to get your feedback, reactions, advice, and then we'll go back, reformulate if necessary, those recommendations, and then bring them forward in a final report to the Green Mountain Care Board and ultimately to the legislature. <clears throat> so we're hoping to get that process done uh, by the middle of April, if not a little earlier, so that the board and the legislature have time to consider that before they uh, the legislature adjourns. So that's the process. We think it will be very open, as transparent as we can make it. Uh, and remember, uh, this is a process and there are a lot of steps to go through. We are not, we are looking 10 years out. So we're, and we're looking not at the hospital in isolation, but as part of an organism that includes the medical neighborhood around it, the available community, the uh, current community needs and available services in the community that would uh, potentially reduce the need for hospital services, as well as the services that are available when the patient or the person is ready to leave the emergency room or the hospital to go home, go to necessary uh, uh, skilled nursing care or receive mental health inpatient treatment. So we're looking at all the pieces of this as well, because clearly the hospital does not act alone and a number of those issues are outside its control. Could go to the next slide, please, Gretchen. So this is the team. Uh, my name's Bruce Hamry. I'm a physician uh, trained a little over 50 years ago. I have uh, practiced and taught medicine in two academic centers <clears throat> for over 20 years, was professor and associate dean at Penn State, and then the executive director of the university hospitals and chief operating officer for that campus. Moved to Geisinger, was the system chief medical officer. We served a population of about a million and a half 
25,000 square miles of mainly mountains and trees in north central Pennsylvania, where the largest uh, industry was forestry. Uh, I had three hospitals, about 1,500 physicians and advanced practice people, 70 clinic sites, and a budget of about $3 billion. Uh, we did a lot of care in very small communities, some as small as 500 people. One of my colleagues in this is Ms. Elizabeth Sutherland. Elizabeth has worked with me and my partners for uh, 10 years. I've been at Oliver Wyman as a partner and chief medical officer for 10 years. And we uh, are in the business of assisting hospitals, health systems, and some small foreign countries to redesign their health systems to achieve the goals outlined in Act 167. Elizabeth has her master's in systems management and engineering from MIT, and she is our a person who is leading the effort on health equity. Elizabeth staffed the Pennsylvania Governor's Commission on Health Equity last year and has worked in a similar area in California and San Francisco. Sam Winter is our engagement manager responsible for keeping all the pieces of this uh, large effort together. He has about 10 years of experience in healthcare consulting. Dr. Chidera Chiweki uh, is a neuropharmacologist uh, with expertise in alcohol and tobacco dependency. And he spent uh, a little over two years with us working with uh, Medicare and Medicaid payers. And Ms. Gretchel Gonzalez, who's staffing this meeting, is a consultant and is responsible for a lot of the day-to-day -day work. So I think a reasonably broad-based team, a lot of experience in doing this sort of thing. And we are excited to be able to work with you in Vermont to uh, advance the cause. Next slide. This is what we're about. We're going to have a short context setting. We want to spend the vast majority of this time listening to you, and we'll have a couple of thought questions toward the end to just stimulate the conversation. Uh, and then we'll provide some additional ways to continue to give us your thoughts, advice, and experience after the meeting. Thank you, Gretchen. So this basically says what you know both at a national level and a state level, healthcare is in serious trouble. Uh, the costs are going up, hospital costs driven by personnel, by uh, costs, by supplies, and by the ever increasing cost of drugs and biologics. There are shortages of every healthcare professional imaginable, including uh, housekeeping staff and dietary staff because McDonald's pays more. Hospitals have unsustainable margins and families are unable to afford care. In Vermont, certainly this threatens the sustainability of the hospitals. There's a considerably uh, large underinsured population. We'll get to that in a minute. Hospital operating margins have been declining generally for several years, and hospital days cash on hand are also going down. We've spoken with two hospitals uh, in the state in the last several weeks who have tripped bond covenants because of one or the other of these issues. And as you know, when you trip a bond covenant, you have a short time to get it fixed or somebody else runs the hospital. Patient access and service wait times are very poor and getting worse. Uh, we have data 18 months ago that wait times were um, many days to months out and certainly more recently have heard stories of six to 12 month plus waits for needed care. Next slide. So uh, the uninsured rate in Vermont, people without any insurance is low compared to the nation, 3.1% versus 8.6, but 40% of people under the age of 65 who have insurance do not have enough money to afford the out-of-pocket expenses for co-pays, deductibles, prescription drugs, 
or over-the-counter meds. And so they delay care or don't seek care at all. Next slide. So this shows the math. According to the 2020 census, median family income in Vermont was a little over $67,000. After deducting state and federal tax, the take-home pay is about $43,000. And you see that if the employer and the uh, uh, wage earner can afford a platinum plan from one of the larger insurance companies in Vermont, the co total cost of those premiums is close to $40,000 a year. Even with that, and with a relatively low deductible, uh, if someone in that family of four becomes ill, the family can expect, uh, can expect to spend a, about $5,000 in out-of-pocket costs. So $5,000 out of a total take-home of $43,000 is uh, an awful lot of money. Next slide. Uh, this is wait time in days, 48 days is 18 months ago. Uh, and you see roughly correlated with the uh, subspecialization uh, at the hospital in terms of weight. But again, uh, stories even then of six to 12 month waits, certainly this has gotten worse. Next slide. Okay, so we've talked about the house rules. Uh, please use chat if you want to add additional comments. Uh, we've had people send web links to this. Uh, happy to get that by chat or later. We're not able to talk about specific issues. It's more for general public, of course, but uh, if there are general uh, specific issues regarding a, a particular patient or need, please contact the Office of the State Healthcare Advocate. Phone number and website are, are there. Uh, and we'll, at the end of this, give you some ways to continue to provide us your advice, recommendations, and input. So next slide, and uh, this is the last one. So these are the general sorts of issues we'd like to ask you to address. What issues are you encountering that limit your ability to provide care to more people? What issues can be addressed to make providing health care more efficient and affordable? What, what can be done to ease your life? Uh, what problems are your patients and their families having in getting preventive services or medical care? Uh, and when your uh, patient needs care from a specialist or from someone else, how do you or can you assist them? How easy is that, uh, that uh, assistance to get? What are the hurdles that you have to go through to get it? How can we improve health equity in Vermont? We know uh, people live in rural areas. They have trouble with transportation. They may have uh, uh, language difficulties or specific needs because of sexual orientation or, or other uh, special needs. And we'd look, really uh, like to hear from you uh, what some of those issues are that your patients are encountering how you and the other systems involved are able to meet those or not. And certainly last, in a perfect world, if you had a blank sheet of paper and unlimited funds, how would things look? Understanding that uh, neither of those things are true and there's not a, the only folks of the printing press or the feds. So with that, I'll stop, ask uh, for your comments, experience, and advice. I'm sure you're not a bashful group. I've, ah, Dr. Chase, please. 
Hi there. Good to see you, Dr. Harmony. And uh, thanks again for your time and all the effort on this. Uh, critically important. I just, uh, just a beginning question. Is, is this, um, is this meeting for providers yes. or is it for administrators? No. Well, I mean, they're welcome, okay. but uh, no, we're aiming it at the people that deliver patient care. Yeah. So yeah. you're quite welcome. Glad to see you again. Okay. So um, is, uh, is Gifford one of the hospitals that's defaulted on their bond covenants? No. Well, not that I know of. No. no. Okay. That was Springfield several years ago, and the other the other two are working it out. And they tell me they think they'll be successful. Fortunately, yeah. So, so one thing I wanted to um, follow up on from last night's meeting, I, I think we heard huge outpouring uh, from patients about their lack of access um, and their sadness for the departure of uh, uh, Dr. Barber. Um, and I talked to her for an hour and a half last night. Um, and she's been at Gifford for, for eight years and a great provider, um, beloved by her patients. And um, I just think that's uh, a horrible thing for, for Gifford to, to let her go, um, especially since, you know, the, they have an active posting on their website for a nurse practitioner to fulfill her position. Hmm. Um, and, and she's 67 years old. Um, and, you know, she told me she, uh, she gets paid like 170 something thousand dollars a year. Uh, nurse practitioner is going to get paid, uh, you know, 130,000. So you're saving $40,000 for all this, um, irreparable damage to Gifford's reputation, to the morale of the entire medical staff. And most importantly, the, the patients who feel abandoned. And, um, you know, I, I just think, uh, uh, you know, I told her she's extremely sad. She's, you know, told me she's going to the press. Uh, and I think, um, you know, Gifford should think strongly about reversing that decision. It's just my opinion. Um, but I think, uh, you know, really, it's about the patients and um you know chelsea is I, I think it's i think it's only because of chelsea and rochester that gifford even qualifies as a federal qualified health center um and to lose your your own she's the only md there um mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know how it's going to work there's a, a pa there but you know pas have to have a participating physician so i don't know that that's one concern i, I have several um, but I just wanted to bring that up, um, just kind of as a follow-up from yesterday's conversation, um, uh, which we just heard patient after patient kind of, um, heartbroken over that departure. And she is as well. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate the follow-up and the comments, sir. Uh, Dr. Andrews. Oh, you're on mute, sir. Okay. Um, hopefully people can hear me okay in my in the car. Yes, um, so thanks for this opportunity. Um, I'm a I'm a cardiologist and um, my background is having come from um, Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center for the last 22 years and previously did outreach uh, one day a week to Gifford and then last year joined this staff full full time and I'm here well, four days a week. Um, and I am concerned about the the, the state of healthcare and um, and the issues of access. And I I the things that I think would be helpful to deliver care um, would be one to provide more support for primary care physicians. Um, so that they can focus on the medical decision making and try to unburden them um, of the, the documentation and EMR interactions, which um, I'm sure you appreciate are quite burdensome. Um, and I, I think this extends to kind of throughout the whole medical staff of, of all hospitals, but it seems like in every patient encounter, there's a few important decisions to be made. Um, that take judgment and expertise 
but it, the visits take a long time because of the cumbersomeness of trying to um, gather the information you need to make the decision and then to interface with the with the EMR to order the tests, order the medications, ensure communication. It's, it seem, just seems like uh, folks are not practicing at the limit of their license. And uh, so somehow we go home tired um, and frustrated and exhausted, but aren't seeing 30 patients or 40 patients a day. Um, seeing far fewer, but it's, it's an exhausting process. So I, I think uh, my, my other comment, I guess, is that it's hard not to feel defensive um, being in a small rural hospital and um, wondering about plans to, to limit um, the existence of small hospitals. And I think they do, my perspective is that they do play an important role in small rural communities, particularly at the primary and the second carry, secondary care level. I think for, for tertiary care, that I understand that the rationale of uh, consolidating that to centers where volumes are high enough to maintain expertise. But uh, as you know from, it sounds like you've had experience in rural areas. Many people don't want to travel a long way and are unwilling to travel a long way to get care. So I, I also want to make a plea to um, appreciate, um, I think, the, the important role that, that small rural hospitals play in providing you know, access for, for people who are, who are intimidated and bewildered by academic medical centers. Right. Um, no. So those are my two com my two suggestions, my two comments, I guess. No, oh, thank you very much. I, I let me ask a question because you're a you're a specialist who's practicing in a small hospital, and you know, and certainly, I mean, I trained in Houston with the Bakey and Cooling many many years ago, um, and the practice of cardiology has advanced a great deal. And you need, uh, you know, for example, echocardiography and some of those things, just even for uh, uh, non-tertiary care purposes. And so are you able to access those where you are? I've heard from, you know, some other specialists, not cardiologists, in other hospitals that they have to send people for pulmonary function tests or something, and it slows down their process of care and, and decision making. Yeah, I, I think we I think we do a good job of kind of delivering the the subspecialty care that can be provided in a small hospital. So, for okay. example, last year we we have a brand new state of the art GE nuclear camera oh. with attenuation correction. So I think our our you know myocardial perfusion spec studies are on par with the tertiary centers. Okay. Um, we have a brand new Philips Epic Echo machine. We have a TE probe, and um, I think our I have a fantastic sonographer. So I think our our routine nuclear medicine, routine echo, including TE, uh, are on par with with okay. really any tertiary medical center. But we know our limits, and if someone needs a cardiac MRI, they need a PET cardiac PET. Um, they need a right heart cath or a coronary angiography, then those those services we don't try to provide. Sure. And, sure. But uh, I think the bread and butter uh, stuff we deliver, we have a kind of very creative solution for pulmonary function tests where uh, pulmonary function tests are done here and they're read by a, a pulmonologist who doesn't wish to see patients, but wants to stay involved in reading pulmonary function tests. So the patient can get the test done here and interpreted here. And if they need to see a pulmonologist, or then they're referred out for that. Right. So I think there are creative ways to deliver at least high quality secondary care yes. in a small rural hospital. Right, and, and very needed. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, sure. 
greatly appreciate your comments, sir, and glad you're able to do that. Oh, you're welcome. Dr. Wade. Thanks for hearing me out a second time, Dr. Harmony. I am Michelle Wade, nurse practitioner, and I am a hospitalist at Gifford. So I do the inpatient side in that okay. particular role. And some of the challenges that Dr. Andrus talked about, it's fabulous that we have on-site echo. We have great um, ability to stress, and then we do work well with our area facilities. But our challenges are different it being a small critical access hospital, when we have really sick patients, we can't get a bed anywhere. Uh -huh. If we need to transfer this patient because they need ICU level care, which we can't supposedly provide because we're a critical access hospital, we can't get them to UVM. We can't get them to Dartmouth. We can't get them to central Vermont, even Rutland. A couple of weeks ago, I sent somebody to Boston. Yeah. Sending people outside our service area is a hardship. It's a hardship for the family, for the patient, and for the providers. I mean, there was a point in time once where I spent over three hours making phone calls, trying to find a destination while I still had a full census to take care of as well. So that's just one of the things. But I think we have a really special place in our community where we take care of a lot of our patients hometown, local, we know them. Their primary care providers call us when they come in and right. say, hey, I saw Mr. So-and-so's in the hospital. Here's the backstory so that we don't have to guess or probe. Right. And having that tight-knit community around our patients is really, really important. And it makes it so that we can also reach out to these primary care providers and say, hey, I admitted Mr. Smith, tell me what you know because you can only see so much in an EHR as Dr. Andrus alluded to. And it, thankfully we have just onboarded a new EHR at our facility. So we're now into one instead of four. We were in four different EHRs between our nursing home, our emergency department, our primary care and our inpatient world. So thankfully we're all in one, but we still have to search out stuff from Dartmouth, from UVM, et cetera, where some specialty care is received. I also want to say that I think it's great that we can refer patients out from wearing my primary care hat and my inpatient hat. We can refer patients out, but part of the long wait for patients I find sometimes is because they're not getting sent back to the right place. If I'm a primary care provider and I refer this patient out for help with a specific issue for a patient, most of the time, if you give me some guidance, I can continue to take care of that patient and decrease the wait time for that specialist so they can see another acute patient and they can just guide me as needed. Right. I think that's an issue. I want to spend just a minute talking about working to the highest extent. We have some phenomenal nurses in the state of Vermont. Many of them are have their hands bound because of rules at either facilities or at the state level where they can't do things that they're trained to do. There's no reason that providers should be doing prior authorizations. Frankly, a nurse doesn't even need to do it. It can be an MA. There's no reason that a provider who has said, yes, refill this patient's prescription, their labs are good, that the nurse can't make that happen. But right now the regs do not allow that to happen. So these are some of the things that we need to do to unburden the providers so that they can do direct patient care. And I know there's other people, but one other thing I really wanna bring up and I'll circle back if there's more time at the end is tuition support for preceptors and for nurses. Yep. Workforce we know is a huge issue. Part of the reason workforce is an issue is because there's not enough faculty. There's not enough faculty. I left faculty. I was full-time faculty for seven years. I make twice as much doing direct care. Right. We have to fix that. Right, thank you. Yeah, I, um, no, I, I understand. I guess, you know, I really take your point about the prior auth and the med refills. And it would be, and I've heard, you know, with the, the um, I guess this, as I understand it, it was a, an issue with the Board of Pharmacy or nursing and the implementation of the electronic health record. 
that now requires the conversation and documentation and all that. And so is that correct or am I wrong? My understanding it has to do with the Board of Pharmacy. Board of Pharmacy. Okay. I'll that thank you. That's where we can we can aim. Um thank you. And would look forward if you don't get a chance to circle back, my email is going to be at the bottom of this. Please add some more detail and some more of these because this is exactly the sort of thing we're looking for to increase the ability of nurse practitioners and PAs and doctors and others to see people, not paperwork. So thank you. But Dr. Andrus. Dr. Andrus, Bruce. You're on mute, sir. Okay, let's go to Dr. Johnston then, please. Hi. Um, yeah, so I'm one of the midwives um, at Gifford. And, you know, a couple of the things that that I've noticed, um, I, I worked in Utah for about 20 years before I came here. Um, and just, you know, a really different regulatory environment, a really different just way of approaching innovation on small levels, right? I was um, intensely involved in a lot of legislative efforts around like freestanding birthing center licensing and and um, just because of population concentrations there, we had very concentrated population centers and then we had extraordinarily remote centers, right? And so it's been, it was a little bit different, but one of the things I was super surprised at here was like the lack of a ability of the small hospitals to pick something that could be a real money maker for them and the more research and investigation that I did and um, I've worked with some of the um, midwife groups here a little bit to work on like the freestanding birthing center you know licensing here um, and and understanding the certificate of need is a huge like there are more required certificates of need in Vermont than pretty much anywhere else in the United States and what we see a lot of nationwide with the places who have more detailed requirements for certificate of need and require those for many smaller things that we end up with a lot of stifling a lot of that free market innovation that does make things more nimble. Um, having and, and then you look at like, I think it was 1979 when they first kind of rolled out the whole concept, like there's a lot of great thinking behind it. Um, to make sure that we aren't duplicating services and that things aren't just hugely, hugely, massively profit driven and, you know, driving out competition, things like that. But um, I, I don't think it ever was meant to really regulate the really, really small things because that small, nimble, innovative community based innovation is really, really Im important. I mean, and, and Utah I was accustomed to the, the way a lot of the level two hospitals managed is because they had a there was one place you got your hips done and they were good at it right um yep. they were extremely good at it and and it was a cash cow for what was able to keep the rest of that community running with a hospital um and as well as the other thing and this is one thing that baffles me too is why so many all our hospitals we have one tertiary care and then as far as like nursery care for babies we're all just level one hospitals without a lot of that support. And having especially worked in freestanding birthing centers is like, there's not a whole lot that a level one hospital has that a freestanding birthing center doesn't have with a lot lower operating costs, right? Oh. And and um, one of the things that, um, you know, uh, Michelle Wade was saying was, you know, the difficulty sometimes in getting a room for our patients who really do need tertiary care. Um, I, I've been in the same position as her, having, um, you know, somebody who, and, and it happens even under the most low risk circumstances, right, that people can get critical. And I have seen my people like pull it out of the woodwork to take phenomenal care of somebody that but then be unable to find a bed. Yep. And, and the same thing, you know, when we've had babies that have had to ship to have to ship a baby six hours away, is, or, you know, three hours away, this is just devastating to these families. And when actually all I needed was a, a NICU nurse or somebody with that level two nursery skill 
who is able to even come to my hospital for three days, you know, for a little bit. We don't have to always staff there. Um, but also, but I also, because a lot of our nurses also work at Dartmouth, um, you know, that hospital has lots and lots and lots of low risk births who would be really well served in their communities, but we have cultures of like bigger is better. And I would be safer going somewhere else where they're really not. We can provide extremely excellent outcomes and care as well as personalized care. You, you don't, you're not a number here. We know you and you know us. And that's one of the beauties of like really good rapport. And so that's another thing is like, you know, some of that just culture of like making robust local health centers to do really, really well what they do. And I don't know if in the individual I don't know, like just how each hospital is its own entity kind of thing. If there would be a way for when we do need a little step up care that needs a little bit deeper skill set, you know, if there would be a way to have little traveling teams, um, you know, particularly right in the middle of COVID, you know, NICUs were shut all over the place because they didn't have, you know, it was no. a lot of some of the staffing issues and stuff. It was like, it was extremely, extremely challenging. Okay, so how's the, I uh, understand what you're saying, how are you staffed for midwives? I mean, everybody else seems to be having problems with nurse, getting enough nurses and everybody. Are, will you have enough um, midwives and OB support to do what you want to do? So um, my midwife support is really good. We have struggled a lot the last two years with um with obstetricians we had a really lovely stable staff um of, of three ob's for for a long time and um there was various reasons why they left um the other thing that we've found is like we've had a lot of people who would have loved to come work here but you know getting work for usually their physician partners is, is challenging in an area yeah has has housing been at all an issue for you to recruit um to some degree but that's uh, the issues have always come before okay um because uh, we've been hearing a lot we you know with trying to get yeah. providers and they can't find housing but okay yeah i mean it it might be for some folks and i've heard of it for some other folks but not anything that i've personally run into we've always been able to you know, find actually pretty darn good housing fairly quickly. Okay, good. <laughs> That's uh, good to hear. Uh, Ms. Dr. Salve? Let's see. Whoops. Hi there. Uh, I'm just trying to get my video. Uh. Hi. So um, I'm not sure if you guys can see me, but um, I'm a nurse practitioner who works in primary care at Gifford. I've been there for seven years, um, and I have some fantastic things to say about Gifford. Um, you know, one quick example is I consider Bruce Andrus to be a friend and a peer, and I love having our specialists on hand for us. Um, they're extremely accessible, and I think that's a really unique quality of our small hospital um, that makes our our staff a stronger team. Um, I think, you know, this, this issue of accessibility is my biggest challenge. Um, I have a what I consider a very, very big panel, way too big for four days of working. And my, my schedule is constantly full, and I can't fit in my patients to come back and see me. Um, and so then I'm, I'm still getting new patients and I, it's really a disservice to my current patients and it makes you know, the care worse for everybody. Um, and then you know, a patient of mine the other day asked me if I would take on her two elderly patients who just moved to the area. She was told Dartmouth you know, has no openings and you know, my staff was, told me that we have a over year waiting list um, to get in. Um, and so sometimes, you know, we do things on the side and, and try to squeeze them in and it's really not fair to me and it's not fair to all my patients. Um, 
and I think part of it, you know, when you think about our full schedules is um, that I agree, if we could have people working to their highest level of their licenses, we could be way more efficient and we could see more patients. Um, but what I'm told is that there's this workforce shortage and we just can't, we don't have those people. And so we have who we have and we just kind of have to deal with it. Um, and, and that means that I'm doing you know, data entry in the middle of my patient visit, trying to find mammograms um, and then you know, figuring out you know, what they're due for and just a lot of like more menial work that is not to my highest level of clinical training um, or even, you know, the people underneath who, who could be working to a different level too. Um, and what we hear from an administration is, we're really sorry, we understand you're burning out and this is just the state of healthcare right now. There is no solution coming and, you know, just try your best. Um, and so that's really leading to more clinicians burning out and the, you know, the nurses and the MAs are unhappy and then the, the patients are unhappy too. Um, you know, and, and I just think we're in a unique spot. I, I love the Gifford patients. I have many multi-generational families. I feel really dedicated to them. Um, and as someone who has three young children, it's really hard to think of this as a sustainable career. Um, and I think about that all the time. Um, and then patients beg me like, please stick around. We've been through 10 doctors, you know, in the last 10 years. Um, so I don't have any easy <laughs> solutions to that, but I think, you know, thinking about burnout, this workforce shortage, working to those highest levels of the licenses, um, you know, and another thing that I think, you know, maybe Gifford could work on is, we don't get paid more based on experience for the nurse practitioners. And that doesn't make any sense to me. I think I'm such a stronger provider seven years in, um, you know, and, and I want to be valued for that. Yeah. I, I, let me just ask a question because, you know, I've been involved in some of this for a while. And there's not really a reason that a medical professional, in a sense, even an MA, although MAs certainly can do the data entry and searching for the information you want, but you know, an educated college graduate or a smart high school person could probably do a lot of that. They couldn't, you know, write the diagnosis and that sort of thing. But if you need mammograms found and that kind of thing. I mean, it would seem to me that there would be other options. I mean, everybody's hoping for, um, you know, uh, artificial intelligence, but, um, you know, there, there may be simpler ways to deal with that. Yeah, I would love to hear what they are, or maybe you could work with our um, administration on that. I mean, I think you might know, we, we just switched to a new electronic medical record yeah. system, and unfortunately, almost none of the data came forward and we're having our poor nurses stay till 8 p.m. at night manually typing it in and then they're really miserable in the day. So it's, oh, yeah. you know, we're told that there weren't other people to hire. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure about that, but okay. that's a challenge. Yeah, Ben was through that a number of years ago with a different system. So I'm sorry to hear that. Other, other comments, uh, experiences, please. Dr. Chase again. Yeah, I'll just piggyback and, and second what, what uh, Rachel said um, about sometimes having a lack of staff um, for, for some of the menial tasks. And, and part of the problem, I mean, the Gifford is such a small hospital that I honestly don't know if there's an extra chair or an extra desk uh, to, um, you know, have a a high school student or someone help with those things. It, it really is a, a small space. Um, and then just a, another kind of separate issue um, in terms of um, uh, efficiency and cost, uh, which is one of the, your solicited inputs, is 
um, turnover of, of staff. Um, you know, we had a, a surgical division meeting today, and um, one of the issues I wanted to bring up, um, I, I got to talk about a little bit, is I, I counted the number of OR scrubs and circulators that I've worked with in the last seven years, and it's uh, um, three operating rooms. And that number is 66. Um, 66. So, so one that is extremely inefficient when they don't know your procedures, they don't know where stuff is. Um, you know, Gifford, uh, you know, the cost of, um, if you average the top outpatient procedures done at Gifford, and you compare it to uh, the closest other critical access hospital, Copley, um, we charge, our average cost is 80% more um, than Copley. We charge, uh, and then if you look at per minute of operating room time, we charge 165 minutes, $165 per minute, um, uh, where Copley charges 106. And so if you have a, you know, this turnover of staff and they, you know, didn't prep the case or they don't know where stuff is, that adds up. And, you know, it also um, affects patient care. Uh, and, you know, the Vermont Program of Quality and Healthcare um, came out with this report that shows the, the number of serious reportable events um, has skyrocketed. And the first thing they attribute that to is vari variation in staff um, because of staffing shortages and turnover. And, so I brought this question, I brought, I brought this issue up in the medical staff meeting, and I I gave a good, reasonable solution to it, um, where I also contracted a hospital in North Conway, uh, New Hampshire, and it's a critical access hospital, same amount of ORs, and they have this night float system um, where uh, they have a team of, of scrubs that and, and nurses that just work um, at night. Uh, and those nurses, we call them the call dogs. They love it. Uh, and the rest of the OR staff loves it because they're not post call all the time. Uh, and so, you know, that's, uh, and I don't, I'm not optimistic. It's going to get much traction. I'm not optimistic. Anything is going to change. Like it hasn't changed, changed in seven years. Um, and, and I, I think that is also touching on Rachel's point where, um, when you're an employed physician, you, you, you are really a physician, um, either contract, unless you have your own practice in your own hospital, but you, you can't make the changes that you want to make to, to make your practice better, to make it more efficient and to save costs because there's these administrative roadblocks. Um, so, yeah. Sorry, right. where, where where do the North Conway folk uh, hospital find those folk? Do you know? Well, well, that's the thing. So, like I said, in seven years I, uh, in Gifford, there's been 66 different OR scrubs and nurses yeah. or nurses. The the ones in North Conway uh, at the um, it's also critical access hospital. They retain their staff, um, and uh, I don't know how they do it, but I think it's partially this. Um, smart system of of having uh unburdening um the or staff from taking call because you know i'm an orthopedic surgeon when i take call i only take call for orthopedic things but the or staff they take call for ortho surgery urology everything so when they're on call they're they're working and then that leads one that leads to them being tired the next day and it just decreases morale and they quit and they leave and um, you know, that's, that's, again, I think it's a big cost issue and I think it, which goes to efficiency, um, and it also goes to patient, uh, safety and, and quality. Yeah. So, um, Great. Really good, good points. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Ms. Wade. I'll actually defer to Dr. Holman since she hasn't been up yet. And then you can circle back to me. Okay. Dr. Holman. Yes. Uh, hi. Um, I, unfortunately, my computer wasn't allowing me to raise my hand, so I'm using my wife's, uh, <laughs> uh, Dr. Holman's uh, computer to do that. And we're both here, so as you can see. Um, 
I'm uh, Alex Sokolowski, a general surgeon at Gifford, and uh, Dawn uh, Holman is my wife, who's also a general surgeon at Gifford. Um, so we work together. Um, so I just have a couple of, uh, I, I guess, a, a comment and then a question for you, uh, kind of a broad question. The comment I have has to do with um, just the setup that the state of Vermont has with uh, post-hospital care, which is a little bit puzzling to me. I, I don't understand it. Um, it has to do with home health um, care. Uh, we've had uh, a few patients um, that require home health immediately after hospitalization, and we've had difficulty obtaining appropriate timely home health. Um, and I've been told, and I don't know how true this is, but I've been told by our social service folks at our hospital that we only have two home health agencies that are uh, licensed, supposed to work at our in our area and no other home health agency is allowed to cross the borders of that area because of the insurance reasons, some sort of contract reasons, et cetera. So if the two agencies that we have uh, are supposed to take care of our patients are not able to provide care in a timely fashion, we are stuck. So our patients don't get care. Uh, so very recently I discharged two patients back to back with colostomy bags that needed care and they couldn't get a phone call from a home health agency for a week. So they were at home for a week without supplies, without any kind of help. So had to, uh, one of them uh, actually came into the emergency room every single day oh. for a week with a leaking colostomy bag because we could not get a home health nurse to come see the patient. Yeah. So, so this is concerning. And, you know, I, uh, admittedly, I come from, you know, the state of Missouri, the state of Illinois, the state of South Carolina, the state of Virginia. Um, the state of New York, uh, which everywhere I practiced uh, in private practice for quite a few years, never had this kind of experience. Um, my sister used to own a home health agency. And when she heard this, uh, she just basically did not believe me. She says, you're lying. That's not possible. You call another agency. Uh, can't do that uh, in the state of Vermont for whatever reason. So that's a, one comment. Um, the question I have is a little bit more broad. Again, coming from a different experience, you know, coming to the state of Vermont and kind of learning about this mysterious uh, entity called the Green Mountain Care Board that um, uh, absolutely makes no sense to me, but uh, for m multiple different reasons. Um, what I don't understand is it seems like we are working against ourselves uh, here with the regulation versus uh, delivery of care. Um, and I uh, did have a conversation with a colleague this morning who explained to me uh, a little bit of how this works. Uh, and I understand that one part of this regulation is to limit um, uh, price gouging by the hospitals, which I 100% agree with. So you don't want the hospitals to start raising prices and patients not being able to afford it and insurance companies start raising their um, uh, coverage rates for the patients because the hospitals are raising prices. That's understandable. What I don't understand, and I hope maybe you can explain to me uh, if you're aware uh, or if you're, you have knowledge of this, uh, is um, how is limiting a hospital's budget um, going to help us provide more and better care to our patient population and hire more uh, uh, qualified healthcare professionals uh, in, in enough quantity to be able to provide that care to all the communities that we serve? So if, if we're limited in our budget, so we can only bring in so much revenue and we can only spend so much money, which is mandated by the legislature, then how are we supposed to increase? For example, you know, I come in, you know, I'm used to doing 600 colonoscopies a year myself. My wife used to doing the same amount, right? So we're, I'm used to doing uh, 10 gallbladder operations a week. That's where I always done, you know. Uh, so for that, I need to have more patients come in and see me. Well, if my hospital is not allowed to raise any more revenue than they're already raising, and which gives me five colonoscopies and one gallbladder a week, then where is my solution? Right. right? So, and by the same token, if, uh, for example, and, and, and it's not to say that we don't have the pop patient population for it. We do. We have patients who are waiting for over a year to get their colonoscopy at other places, 
Yeah. But how can we bring them in if we're not allowed to get that revenue from the insurance company because it's going to put us over budget? So that's one question. Uh, the second question about this is, you know, everybody's up in arms about, you know, uh, the physicians being let go and the nurse practitioners and if the physician assistants being hired. And I understand their point, but the second point, um, the other side of the coin is if we're limited as to how much care we can provide and we're limited as to how many people we can hire to provide that care, how are we supposed to hire more physicians and more nurse practitioners and more PAs if our budgets are limited that who we can pay how much, right? So, so can you maybe put, shine a little bit of light on that? I mean, how, how is this, how does this square? I don't understand the, the logistics and the, and the economics of this. Yeah, and, and to, be, to be blunt, neither do I. Okay. okay. So, no, I, I understand what you're saying, sir. Uh, and I, it, it's one of those issues that we're going to have to address. Okay. I mean, I, I agree with you. I think, you know, the, the issue of how you allow a hospital to set its budget and how much control you give it. I mean, I've run a couple and um, one would like some latitude in that so that you can adjust salaries and pay people and build the business. And I think that's one of the efforts uh, of this activity, because clearly, I mean, I, you know, I'm an ID guy, not a not a surgeon, not a GI guy. But when I look at the rate of screening colonoscopies, by overpopulation against what's recommended, it's low, right? And that's an important cancer screening thing. So to me, that's one of those things that we've got to fix. Um, and there, there are a bunch of other sort of clinically relevant things too. But, but no, I take your point. I agree with you. Uh, I think that, you know, th there have been not only constraints on hospital budgets put there by the Green Mountain Board, but also at other levels. And um, some of those have different regulatory levers, for example, that I, I suspect will need to be addressed. But I, I take your point absolutely. I'm glad you and your wife are there, and we'll try to make it possible for you to do what you do and and help people. I mean, that, that's all I can say. This process is early. It will require um, legislative action. Uh, it will require, as you've heard some of the other folk um, uh, talk about uh, some changes in um, uh, some of the professional licensure and regulations. Um, I would add for you, I've, I've practiced in Missouri and Virginia too, and it's a and Tennessee, and it's a considerably different, different environment. So, um, but, you know, the goal is to get your kind of services more readily available in the communities that are not Burlington. Right. So thank you uh, for your comments and, uh, and questions. I wish I could answer them more fully. Thank you. Uh, let's go to, to Matthew Boutelier, please, before we go back uh, to Dr. Chase. Hi, thanks for taking my time. I've listened you know, to our community members and my colleagues tonight, but what has frustrated me over this is, you know, actually is uh, Dr. Chase using both of these forums to air his grievances. You know, it, in my opinion, I don't think he's operated here in over 18 months to then pinpoint management it seems to be pretty unfair when he's uh, has not been involved in the system for over 18 months. And it's just disappointing to see that he's using this as his forum. That's really all I have to say. All right, I appreciate your pointing that out, sir. Thank you. Uh, we'll go back to Dr. Chase briefly, and then to Mr. Andrus and Ms. Wade. 
Okay, I, I just want to apologize, Matt. I, I didn't mean to... Oh. But let's not get into a back and forth here, right. okay? I, I, let's, I, let's deal with the I, issues I'm trying to deal I, with. I'm trying, and I'm trying to go off this, uh, um, the the solicited questions that that you asked. But um, in terms of, there's, I guess I'll, I, so I have uh, some insight, I think, or my opinion on on Alex's question about about the the budget. Um, happy to discuss that if if my opinion on that if if you want or not and then there's a question in the chat about you, you know really my intention here is to Im improve the cost of things and and uh in terms of practicing at gifford uh i've been there for seven years i have full privileges at gifford i've offered any time uh, to take call at gifford for my community and my patients currently we have no call um, and I, I, I will take call any time for, for my patients at Gifford. It's not my decision not to, not to take call at, at Gifford. I just want to make that pretty clear. Okay. okay. Uh, um, but, but in terms of, so why there has to be some kind of a uh, budgetary cap in, in Vermont is because Vermonters pay for it. So the, the cost of health insurance premiums is going up 15% a year. And that's because of the hospital budgets. Um, so if hospital budgets are unlimited, then healthcare is unaffordable because the um, the premiums are just too much. I, I mean, we, we presented that. So that's why there has to be some, some cap. I, I do agree though, in terms of, um, uh, you know, I, I think there should be hospitals should, hospitals who provide low cost care should be able to um, have you know, extra uh, revenue, if they're per unit of care, if it's really, if it's a good value, the hospitals that are providing value care, they, I don't think their revenue should be limited. Um, but, but that's, that's my take on, on what I know about um, the, the Green Mountain Care Board, uh, or this, this hospital thing. I just want to address a question in the chat. And, and again, <laughs> my intention here is to improve cost, improve e efficiency. And that's why I suggested this, um, this night float call system. Um, and I think uh, everyone can agree that uh, retention is a, a real issue. Um, and, and so in the chat, someone asked, is, is North Conway Maine Medical? And yeah, it's part of Maine, Maine Medical. Um, and then they also asked, do they do stay interviews? um at at Maine medical and and they do or at north conway and so they do they do a gallup uh employee engagement survey there um and i think that's really valuable uh and i you know i was at gifford for um still am for for over five years um there was never a, a, an employee engagement survey done um and from all the physicians i know who have left there um, there's been no exit interviews. So, uh, you know, I, I just, <laughs> I think, um, I don't think you can, I don't think I'm airing my grievances by saying retention is a, is a real issue. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, uh, Mr. Boutea, and I apologize for the pronunciation, so. Matthew? Okay, let's go to Mr. Anders, please. Dr. Anders. Hi, hi, thanks. Um, I'm, I, I want to address the uh, your invitation to um, you know to consider a clean sheet of paper um, and a fresh kind of fresh look, and I, I want to try to be a little more um, a little more concrete about. Um, about a kind of vision for improved healthcare in Vermont. So uh, sort of my idea, vision of the ideal is that um, a, a schedule is set up such that there's always capacity each day for 
urgent visits, people who have urgent need. Um, we have to, we can't oversubscribe clinicians so that there's no capacity for urgent visits. One of the basic, uh, you know, obligations of of clinicians is to provide healthcare for the acutely ill. So you have to protect that. And then I, I think that the appointment should be structured such that a medical assistant can go into the room, kind of collect a basic present illness from the patient. What are your main concerns? What, what do you need um, from this visit? And collect as much information as possible. And if that's a urinalysis, if that's a, means getting a peak flow meter, if that means um, checking blood sugars and getting that stuff collected before the clinician walks in the room. If it's a periodic health exam, then it should be the med should be someone like a medical assistant who has got, who reviews a chart and learns this person needs a mammogram, a colonoscopy, and a tetanus shot and a flu shot, and I have that all ready and and ask the nurse practitioner or PA or physician, hey, this is what's needed. Would you like me to get this done for you? The clinician can walk into the room, talk to the patient without typing on a computer, agree on a diagnosis and a plan, and then instruct the medical assistant, please enter these orders, order these tests, I'll sign them off and then walks into the next room where a medical assistant is presenting the, the question and data for them. The other part of this utopian vision is if the primary physician has a question that they're uncertain about, it, ideally they would have immediate access by Zoom or by telephone to a specialist. And I, it seems to me a, there's a lot of referrals that are made and that people wait months for to answer a fairly specific question that if we had immediate access to a consultant, we could get an answer in two minutes. Mm -hmm. So in, in this utopian world, you'd, you'd be able to pick up a phone and get help and that would include mental health and social work. But I think we need to, you need to support um, primary care physicians so they can um, they can get specific answers quickly, and that they can um, they can interact with patients more and with computers less. So, I just want to make that a little more granular than my previous statements. So, thanks. No, thank you. And I can, if I can remember his contact information, I know a man in Sacramento, California, who does exactly that. It took him six months to to you know, train his MA and get her comfortable and him be comfortable, but that's exactly what he does. You know, she collects the information, she reviews the lab, she presents the patient. She goes, actually goes into the exam room with them. She has a portable terminal and while he's talking to the patient and making observations, she enters it. When the interview's done, he adds the diagnoses, couple of comments, signs accept, and when he walks out of the room, it's all done. So take your point, made notes, and uh, you know, great thoughts. Thank you. Well, I don't know that we can get to that operational level, but certainly with the uh, with the appropriate folk and training and support, that's possible to get there. Thank you very much. That's a great exposition, Dr. Andrus. Yeah. Well, thank you. Ms. Wade. Well, Bruce is a tough act to follow, but um, I want to go back a little bit to some of the social determinants of health and yes. issues in that area. Um, as you know, Gifford's fairly rural. And so I know it was brought up during the community forum about transportation, so I won't rehash that one. But, you know, in the questions you posed out to us, one of the things is, what is your facility doing to help with this? And I mean, some of the things that we do that I think need to be noted are, you know, we do Veggie Van Go, and that line wraps around the block. We have to have people controlling traffic out on Route 12 the day that we have them there. 
and we feed a large number of people in the community through that program. During COVID, we did all kinds of meals to go and things like that. We have a community health team that works in our communities to try to get people into their appointments, to try to help them understand things, to try to help them get set up with insurances when they don't have insurance. So I do think we embrace that fairly well. However, there's not enough community health team members to serve the population. As you pointed out in your slides, there's a very underinsured population in Vermont. And that underinsured population is the one that they're often helping because they've got huge copays or they're yeah. unable to afford meds, which is why they land in the ED or in my inpatient unit. Right. Um, another thing that was on your um, list here that I wanted to talk about is, you know, who are the stakeholders in the community that share these same priorities? I got to tell you, Gifford's got a really neat community. I don't live in that town. I drive an hour and a half to go to work at Gifford because I like it there and they've got a great community. You might remember I was on your Rutland forum because that's where yes, I live. And so yeah. I, I think that they do a great job embracing the, the stakeholders in town. The entire town comes together, all of the um, people that have businesses in town, and they support both the patients in town as well as Gifford. And just, I don't want to start a dialogue, but I do want you to know we did hire a phenomenal orthopedic Gifford, and we do have orthopedic Good. coverage. Good. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, it, it's interesting. I spoke to the Vermont UVM people today, and they've, you know, done a, a fair, they, they've, in, at least in the children's hospital, really kept track of the social determinants of health. And they said, you know, sort of what they'd come up with was the most, uh, uh, the best predictor of a lot of those needs was uh, Medicaid enrollment, uh, which, you know, makes sense. But Completely uh, agree. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Andrus again, or did you not lower your hand? Okay, Dr. Andrus. Okay, Dr. John. Yeah, that was just. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you're you're zinging, but can't hear you. Me getting lower. Okay. No, I'm sorry. You can't can't hear you. I'm gonna I'm gonna go to Dr. Johnson. Johnston. Yeah. So I Please. wanted to just okay. I just wanted to uh, just kind of follow up a little bit on what um, Michelle said about the social determinants help, and also kind of what Katja Evans has said in the in the chat. Um, we recently, um, <clears throat> oh, it's maybe been a year and a half. Um, we have a community health team member in our office now, part-time. She's there 20 um, hours a week. And I cannot tell you the phenomenal difference her presence has made in our office, simply arranging all of the things and being able to do um, short-term mental health um, work and counseling. Um, she is one of those arms of my people who um, I really can say, hey, Justine, <laughs> Here's the situations. Can you take care of this? And she does. Um, I think that has made it's it's enabled us to take care of a lot of people that we used to transfer out simply because we didn't have that social support network now. And now these people are able to be cared for right in their communities. They're not th these folks with the highest needs and the most difficulty interacting with large systems and stuff. We're able to take care of them, and and they live a block away. And that's phenomenal, right? Um, it's a lot easier. I mean, a lot of them are dead. They're able to walk to their care appointment and now I have the things to take care of them with, right? And so I think, um, I'm with Kasha. I think that has been, um, that, that's been phenomenal. And I think particularly the more we come to understand that those social determinants are really determinants. Oh. It's not just a word. Yeah. Yeah. Um, extremely, especially for new families. And, and the more we can help, I mean, my 
you know, I, I, I'm a huge fan of primary care. I think it needs to be really strong, but also launching families well, particularly where for some people with their birth experience, this is their first time really interfacing on a, on a sustained level with the healthcare system. And then if we get that to be a positive experience and we get them hooked into those resources and we get them launched well and with good mentor resources and stuff, their families are much better off than if than if they struggle if they and if they're lost um to a lot of follow-up and stuff and so um you know thankfully getting out of covid kind of going back to creating our mom's groups and our our local resources that create community and support um so i i think that's an incredibly important part of the of the of the process no absolutely thank you for pointing that out and the, the value of the community health team how, how um effective, I guess, is the coordination between the different state agencies. You know, you, you've got a CHIP program, you've got a mental health program, you've got these different ones. And uh, it would seem to me that's where your social support staff would be particularly important is helping get all those folk on the same it, it is because I think the coordination is actually really poor. Um, we joke on a regular basis that she has a master's degree and 20 years of experience and she still struggles with it. Okay. Right? Are there way yeah, well, that's what I want to know because I, you know, we're, as I said, we're talking to the various state agencies. And as I may have mentioned, the mental, I know the mental health, uh, the lady who's in charge of the mental health group, she's looking for a thousand people, right? She's a thousand uh, mental health professionals short. Mm -hmm. So, and, and I'm sure that occurs in some of the other agencies. And, and what I had heard in a different hospital area a few weeks back was that you know they've seen enough turnover that some of the newer folks who have been hired in some of the different agencies are not yet familiar with all the with the job and all the roles and what the rules may be. So I, have you got? I think I think that's probably true. Um, you know, it, it took a little while for her to kind of run up, but I think you know now that she knows kind of the right people to call, the right behind the scenes kind of stuff to do. I think she does. I mean, I've seen this with the gal who used to do some of what she does too. You call them up sometimes and be like, "No, this is the way it's done. I'm telling you, this is the way it's done, and I'm gonna I'm gonna be here till you get it done. I'm telling you how it's done. <laughs> you know, and getting our getting our babies covered on Medicaid. Yeah. You know, and making sure that sort of stuff happens because a lot of times they they don't know. Okay. Thank yeah. you very much. Mm -hmm. Appreciate the. Uh the comment and the information. Thank you. Other uh, other comments? Yes, dental care. Um, and I guess question, that's a question for you because one of the other things uh, for the group, one of the other things is that certainly there are some services which the individual small hospitals may not be able to support by themselves. And so one of the things we're trying to think about are things like mobile dental clinics or mobile mammography units or whatever that could be, in a sense, regionalized. The services shared between several of the smaller hospitals. Um, would something like that concept fit in your area? Uh, Ms. Johnson again and Ms. Wade. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I mean, I'll agree with that. I mean, I, that's that's one of my things, I think, as far as like, um, like that level two kind of nursery care, right? instead of having staff and staff and extent expensive bed in a level three or a level four nursery, yeah. um, you know, be able to have just that, that mid-level kind of support by, you know, really one person would do it with the, with telehealth as well as, you know, having that presence and having seen that process. Honestly, I think a lot of our providers would very easily get more up to speed. One of the other things that I would love to see is more coordination 
um, say with taking, um, you know, our nurses and giving them a rotation for one week a year or whatever in a NICU setting, right? So that they can kind of hone some of those skills that very rarely come up that we need, but when we do, they're really excellent to have. Yeah, great idea. Yeah. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, Dr. Salway. Um, I'm not sure you know, but we do actually have a mobile dental um, unit that we use through the hub. Um, I did is, not know that. That's yeah, great. Yeah, and it's, it's helpful. However, they only do cleanings and they do do all ages. So our kids go there too. But, you know, unfortunately, a lot of our patient population needs much more than dental cleanings. And then we don't really have anywhere to send them or at least not an affordable place to send them. Um, and I just wanted to piggyback that we also have um, a mental health team embedded in our primary care, which is phenomenal. Um, we have two social workers, um, a number of other therapists, and then unfortunately our psychiatric nurse practitioner who's um, been there for a number of years is leaving. Um, so that's been extremely helpful, but we really need more psychiatric support in our community. And I'm sure everyone's telling you that. Um, and, and so that's a lot of our patients go to Clara Martin, which is right in our community, um, but they only have one psychiatrist and there's, you know, a six month waiting list there too. So um, not sure how you could uh, approach that, but we would love the help. Thank you. Are the, the <clears throat> question, do the uh, mental health people in your clinic do more than screening? Do they carry a group of patients that they treat? Yeah, they carry a group of patients. They also respond in the moment if you have oh. someone with suicidal ideation. Um, they also help and work with our Blueprint Community Health Team to help, you know, with those social services. Um, so it's kind of a combination there. And then and then some do med management. And are you, you the practice you're in is is what sort of practice? Are you in a private practice, a FQHC? Oh, no, no. I work at Gifford. I'm in the... Um, I'm in the primary care family medicine department. I see. Okay, Gifford. fine. Thanks. Yeah. I just, just wanted to understand. Thank you very much. Sounds like a great, great team. Yeah. Ms. Ms. Wade. So yeah, Rachel, we are an FQHC for primary care to answer your question. Um, but the one thing that I see that could be really helpful as a floating service would be dialysis. That's something where we get really hung up and, you know, patients need to be dialed three times a week usually. And if I have a patient in the hospital for heart failure, I can manage the patient until they got to be dialed. And now I have to transfer that patient. Yeah. So that might be something that is useful that can float between multiple facilities around the state too, because again, patients don't need it every day. You know, if they're that sick, they they don't belong at a, at one of our hospitals. But if they just need their regular dialysis, then it would be beneficial to them. Right. No, the great, great point. Thank you. I've heard that before. Uh, so it's important. Thank you. Other comments? We have half an hour left. We are in danger of letting you go finish your supper. Any other, I'll ask if there are any public comments or if Senator McDonald wants to make any final comments. Well, I, I've been a patient that um it differed on several occasions, and I know they work hard, and they're part of the, they're the central part of the community. Sure. Um, I see most of the folks tonight that have been making suggestions at work there seem to be looking for how to improve things in the future, and um, I'm, this has been an education for me. I'll have to ponder it and see, and I'll be better prepared when we discuss when the health care committee and, and the Senate makes its recommendations and asks for our input. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Well, let's, yes, uh, we'll give Dr. Chase three minutes for a final comment, and then we're going to draw this to a close. Sir. Yeah, I just, I just didn't want there to be any confusion that I absolutely love Gifford. 
Uh, I think it's a great hospital, great people, um, my colleagues, but mostly the patients. And and really, my interest is um, in line with Gifford's mission, which is improving uh, uh, and creating access to affordable quality health care. Um, and uh, I, I just wanted to make that clear. If, if it wasn't. So everything is, uh, if it's criticism, it's constructive. Um, and uh, I think there's just some great comments tonight and it was great to hear my colleagues and, and thanks for listening. Great, thank you. Uh, could, could we go to the last slide, please? Okay, so this is the way to continue to give us your advice, experience and uh, suggestions and input. And I greatly appreciate everybody's comments tonight and the help you've given uh, and the, the suggestions made. We'll try to take them under consideration and see how we can uh, make a number of them happen. Um, there are two ways to do this. The public way is to go to the Green Mountain Care Board website, which is up at the top, gmcboard.vermont.gov backslash act-167-community-meetings. And if you actually just go to the Green Mountain Board website, then you get to choose the community meeting part. And there you can leave a written comment, either with your name attached or not. They'll be posted. We do monitor those. We do collect those for this, this project. And we will add those to the comments you've made and others and take those into consideration. The other way is that my business email is at the bottom of this. It's bruce.hammery at oliverwyman.com. If you send me a note because there's something you didn't want to say in public or you have a thought tomorrow morning in the shower or, you know, next weekend, uh, whenever, I can certainly acknowledge it. I, you know, as you know, we're going through all these meetings and all this other stuff. So I probably won't be able to engage in a discussion with you by email. But this is another way for you to get directly uh, your comments in, in, in consideration. So we'll close this out. Uh, thank you again very much. I know you're all finished a very busy day and you've taken some time from your families. We appreciate all of that. I uh, hope you'll have a, a good Veterans Day and a happy Thanksgiving. And again, thank you very much for your help and attention tonight.